I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, palliative care in a tertiary care center because uh, we hear a lot about palliative care. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about uh, uh, what the terms mean and, and, uh, and what they are. Um, and, and really, to, to make it very simple, we look after patients who are not going to be cured from their disease. Uh, they're no longer having illness that's responsive to curative treatment. And it's a holistic approach, and we really look at controlling uh, symptoms such as pain uh, and other symptoms, including psychological and spiritual issues. And very importantly within the definition of palliative care is that palliative care does not hasten death. It is one of the World Health Organization uh, definition of palliative care. When we also look at palliative care, what's sometimes lost it, 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 to, to many people is that we are not only involved with patients who are dying. Usually patients think about palliative care and it's, you know, that's it. In fact, uh, we had Bridget uh, Federley who said she's the last person. In fact, I'm the last person people see. They don't actually see you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in fact, you know, we rarely get invited anywhere. <laughs>
and where you can see them for, for symptom issues, as I mentioned, uh, or to discuss the care plan. And when I talk about care plan, I'm talking about communicating with the patient, uh, discussing some of the issues involved in end-of-life care, making sure they have advanced directives, um, a level of care, uh, whether uh, they have a DNR sign for a home if they're home, uh, whether they would want feeding tubes, hydration, uh, all the issues around uh, end-of-life care. Now central to all of this is the question of prognosis. Uh, Niels Bohr, uh, the physicist, said something very astute. He said that prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> now, we have a bill called Bill 52, an act for spending, uh, respecting end-of-life care. End of life. Nobody has actually asked, what does that mean? What is end of life care? Uh, is end of life when you're imminently dying? Is end of life when you have a terminal diagnosis? Is end of life when you meet the criteria for being admitted to a palliative care unit? What is end of life? Uh, I'll tell you two stories. Uh, one is a patient um, who I saw uh, a number of years ago in a nursing home. Uh, she was about 97 years old, she had severe dementia, she was being fed um, mush, uh, as many of you have probably seen in nursing homes because she was at risk of aspirating. And uh, I thought that this woman had a prognosis of a few days or a few weeks, which is what I wrote in the chart. Unfortunately, it was sort of illegal to rip things out of the chart. So two years later, when she's still there, um, I'm thinking, how do I get rid of that note? Uh, I'm a so-called expert in end-of-life care. I had another patient when uh, they asked me to see who uh, had congestive heart failure, and she was on uh, medical floor at the MGH. And, uh, and I was asked to see her by one of the higher-ups in the hospital because the family member was a donor. And uh, could I see this patient? And uh, transfer her to the palliative care unit. So I went and saw the patient, and she had congestive heart failure, and I spoke to the cardiologist, and I said, is, is your patient dying? And he said, well, gee, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I said, yeah, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so um, uh, after discussing this with the cardiologist, I told the family that I can't really transfer your mother to the palliative care unit because I don't know what her prognosis is. She may get better, she may not get better. It's really hard to predict. Uh, so I would then go by the, the, and they were very angry by the way, and I'd go by the unit, uh, the medical floor every, uh, every couple of days, and so she was still there. After a month I feel a little better, after two months I feel even better. And after about two and a half, three months I see she's no longer there. And I said, what happened to Mrs. X? And she said, oh, uh, she was transferred to a, a rehab facility. I said, oh, okay, good, I felt good about that. <laughs> and I was flash forward about a year, and I'm sitting at a dinner, uh, uh, and, and uh, it's a foundation dinner, and somebody's sitting beside me, and she said, oh, what do you do? I said, I'm a palliative care physician. She said, oh, you know, my mother-in-law was in the hospital a couple of years ago. I go, yes, and then I'm thinking, donor, mother-in-law, I'm starting to get a little nervous. And she said, yeah, you know, they wanted to put my mother to palliative care, or mother-in-law, and um, I said, yes. I said, but they, 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 they didn't want to admit her, uh, because they didn't know if she, you know, what her prognosis is. I said, oh, okay, let me ask you, what, what's your mother, what happened to your mother-in-law? She says, oh, she's working as a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of which to say is this is a very vague term. 10% uh, of patients die suddenly. Uh, you know, we talk about CPR, that's, that's really, you know, for 10% of the patients who die uh, unexpectedly and suddenly. If you look at five-year survival rates for patients with cancer, if you have lung cancer that's metastatic and diagnosis, you may have a less than 5% chance of living five years. If you have breast cancer that's localized, you probably have a 98 to 99% chance of living for five years. We're talking about the same disease, which is cancer, with many different outcomes. Uh, but we know that when a patient with cancer starts to deteriorate and reaches a certain functional level, especially if they're younger, that the reason this is happening is because of their illness. And the likelihood they're surviving uh, less than a few months is, is pretty clear. On the other hand, patients with, they say, why don't we see more patients with heart failure, with chronic lung disease? 
Because their, their disease goes like this. They have ups and downs and ups and downs and whoops, they think it's over and oops, they're back home. And uh, oh, you, you saw the patient, you, can you admit this patient to palliative care from the emergency room? I said, didn't I see this patient last year? And then you asked me the same thing. It's very hard to predict. And yet, and, and patients with dementia can sometimes live for, for months and years uh, with a fairly advanced disease. So when we talk about end of life, what exactly are we talking about? And as much as we throw that term around, as much as I've seen politicians throw that term around, I don't really know what they're talking about, so I don't know how they know what they're talking about. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, you know, um, when we look at, at the evolution of, of Bill 52 and the request for assisted dying in the past, uh, many of it came from uh, patients who had advanced neurological diseases. And even if you go back and you look at some of the uh, court decisions, uh, take Sue Rodriguez, for instance, who petitioned the court uh, in the early 1990s and basically died two and a half years later. So trying to use end of life uh, as, a, as an entry into assisted suicide becomes very difficult because we can't really define uh, for, for many patients what end of life is. Now one of the things we have to do when we refer patients to the West Island is to try to give them some sense of whether this patient is going to be alive in, in, in three months or not because we have limited resources. But it's not a very, it's not a very simple uh, thing to do. Uh, in addition to a consult service in the tertiary care hospital, uh, we have a day hospital. So patients who are either referred to us after their treatments have ended, or we see patients who have complex symptoms uh, concurrently with their um, uh, disease treatment. We also have a cancer pain clinic. Uh, our cancer pain clinic is now in its fourth year. We've seen a, a, an average of 200 patients a year over the last three years. It consists of palliative care physicians, anesthesiologists, uh, um, uh, radiation oncologist, and we have a nurse, uh, and we have referral to the psychosocial oncology. And we have available for patients different interventions. Uh, we have local anesthetics that could be injected. Uh, we have uh, cementoplasty, vertebroplasty to strengthen people's spines if they have collapsed vertebrae. There's a number of different uh, things that, that we have available for these patients. And again, not that I want to complain too much about Bill 52, uh, but uh, they read you earlier the actual objectives of Bill 52. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, they mentioned in the bill throughout the continuum of care, uh, blah, 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 uh, including prevention and relief of suffering. I just want to tell you there is not one other word in this bill that relates to prevention or relief of suffering. The only thing that Bill 52 does is introduces a medical act, which is basically euthanasia. You should be aware of that. It's not physician-assisted suicide. And the only thing that, and, and all the things related to end-of-life care in terms of advanced directives, none of this, this is new. The only thing that's new in, in Bill 52 is, is the request of you to ask your physician to end your life. Uh, finally, I, I'd like to just mention that in addition to services related to uh, uh, you know, our day hospital, our cancer pain program, um, we offer a lot of uh, programs that help people deal with their illness either through uh, can support, uh, which is uh, originally founded by, by the Cedars Foundation, uh, and psychosocial oncology programs where the patients have access to a psychologist to deal with some of the issues uh, around illness. And um, we have, in addition, programs that relate to cancer rehabilitation, so patients who are going through treatment can have access uh, to nutritionists, dietitians, uh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists to help them improve their function. We have a lymphedema program that many of you may be familiar with. It's one of the only ones in Eastern Canada. Dr. Anna Towers runs it to help people who've gone through especially breast cancer treatment and are left with debilitating uh, edema. And finally, just to tell you how far we've gotten away from death and dying, is we have a survivorship program. And um, uh, people ask me, how, how come we have uh, a survivorship program? So I have a couple of minutes. I'll just tell you, we have a survivorship program at the MUHC because my son used to live in Washington. And um, you asked me, what does that matter? Uh, well, Cedars asked me to go to a conference on survivorship. And I said, no, I do palliative care and our patients are dying. And I said, where is it? They said, it's in Washington. I said, oh, OK, you'll have the evening to see my son. And they go, uh, yeah, sure. So I went to the survivorship conference, and, and it was actually quite fascinating, uh, you know, because basically what it deals with is all the patients 
uh, who go through treatment who, are, who still suffer from pain, uh, multiple symptoms, uh, and the difficulty they have accessing family physicians and the lack of information that the patients receive. So we now have a pilot pro pro uh, program at the NUHC for patients with breast cancer, uh, where we've now trained 140 family physicians uh, to look after patients uh, who have gone through cancer treatment. So it's a far cry from end of life care and palliative care. Uh, but it's all part of a continuum. And I think one of the things that the bill initially tried to do, and they actually said it in the first reading of the bill, is that end of life is palliative care, which means uh, assisted death. And that's the way the initial bill was, uh, was defined. In fact, uh, we have been doing palliative care, and you have been doing palliative care. We have been aiding patients through the dying process uh, through many years. I, I wish I had time, I could speak to you for an hour about the difference between euthanasia and, and palliative sedation, but that would, uh, would, uh, would really take us well into the evening. Um, but I just want to, you know, just mention this uh, in passing, because uh, for all the discussion about uh, end-of-life care and Bill 52, the great, 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 great majority of patients want to live. Uh, and in fact, they will do anything to continue living. Uh, so the discussion should be more focused on the things that we do to prolong people's lives as opposed to the things that some people want us to do to shorten people's lives. Uh, when, when we have concerns about uh, patients uh, and Bill 52, um, my concern is that we are already seeing as the, uh, if you think you're the Grim Reaper, uh, we're certainly seen as the Grim Reaper. People think that you refer to palliative care, we're gonna give more morphine, that we need the beds, that we wanna get rid of patients. I hear that all the time, you know, and, uh, and it's uh, very uh, worrisome for me that with the passage of Bill 52, that people will equate palliative care with aid and dying, which is what the initial bill tried to do, and people still now put them all together because it was in the news so much. And my concern is that people who actually need to come for symptom control and palliative care won't come because they're in fact afraid of uh, us basically pushing them along uh, the road towards uh, assisted death and hasten death. So uh, we'll see how this plays out. Uh, as uh, Chris McKinnon said earlier, there's not much that's been done to study the impact that this will have on families and, and physicians and nurses and everyone else uh, in the healthcare system.